Interesting, Hello. now I'm even more curious. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Discourse for the week of March 29th, 2021. The Discourse is our weekly news show here at the NYU Game Center, the game design department at New York University. Each week, professors Frank Lance and Naomi Clark talk about game industry news and give us their scorching hot takes. Take it away, Frank and Naomi. Um, yeah, so Hello. as you can tell from mm -hmm. that opening, the, the way this works, this is just a little slice of what's happening 24 seven. Logan and, and Naomi and I and Mirabai are just hanging out, talking about things. <laughs> <laughs> we just like hit a button to make it go live. But the same thing is happening yeah. at all Usually times, Logan's so. like, shut up, shut up guys, shut up for a second. But uh, yeah. this time I didn't hear him. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, hey, how's it going, Naomi? How you doing this week? Oh, I'm doing okay, uh, yeah, a little bit. A little bit tired and under the weather, but this uh, the discourse always energizes me, along with a cup of coffee. It's true. Yeah, give a little jolt. Um, well, let's jump into it, shall we? Uh, to begin with, we have a few links uh, about game history. Um, this first one is someone that uh, something Chris Wallace, I think, shared with us. Uh, is a a, a, a video um, on YouTube uh, called Texture Archaeology, which starts out with an exploration of this particular texture, Hall this brick texture. texture, which turns out to be present in so many games. This is ubiquitous. You would never imagine that the same texture that's used in Super Mario 64 also shows up in Banjo-Kazooie and just like hundreds, even thousands of games. You can, it's just this little uh, bit of clip art. Yep. Um, it's not it's not shocking to me i guess i don't know maybe it's from seeing the sausage be made so many times but they're like why were competitors sharing graphics and it's like yeah because everybody just gets their cobblestone graphic from like why would you just like make your own cobblestone graphic unless you're obsessive about having like like doing everything in house yeah like a lot of a lot of games get things from you know, clip art sources and uh, yeah, some texture CDs. That's that's what these guys are really doing with the texture archeology, span which I guess is what they're calling this, right? They're like, which texture CD did this come from? Uh, I don't know, this is sort of fascinating to watch from an outside point of view. Like there's this culture that is kind of seeing the development practices of the nineties and even the two thousands as this like strange, like distant history because they were children uh, and kind of saying, wow, did you guys know that these are actually photographs? They're photographs of the real world. 
that then got turned into computer graphics. And so what you're actually looking at is a photograph. It's like, okay, kind of, I guess that's interesting if, if you have no idea about how video games are made, but am I, am I too jaded about this? I don't know. I don't know. I think there's, our students, uh, I think often have to navigate a certain anxiety about uh, asset creation. Sure, um, right. There is a, there is still a sense in which using assets that you are gathering from some other source is a signal that you're not as serious or that you're doing things sort of uh, cheaply or, or um, cutting corners or it's not entirely creative. Uh, but it's good to see that this is just how video games are built. Everyone is in the same boat. Right. It's, it's kind of a relatively recent weird bias that I think, you know, is associated with a f like deluge of small, low effort games on, I don't know, so, you know, Steam Greenlight or something, right? They're like, people are just, uh, are releasing sh like shovelware stuff, which I guess right. existed back in the day too. But yeah, like that's not, that's not what really distinguishes like stuff that's uh, like fake games that are just shovelware from from like something that someone's put thought into it's yeah. it's not whether they've reused assets i don't know i hope maybe this goes a little ways towards dispelling that notion right that and 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 the the, the thing that's fascinating to me is is that they they're doing this archaeology and they're like we couldn't figure out where this cobblestone came from and it turns out it comes with a program called alias 3 and i'm like yeah, it's it's that's alias wavefront. That's like the pre that's the the program that became Maya, right? Right. Yeah. And I don't think that's even mentioned in this like Maya is never mentioned in this video. It's like yeah, like yeah. Let me ask you a question, <laughs> Naomi. Is this yeah. is this video which is clearly like well researched and well produced right. as like is this good? Is it good that we have this kind of like uh, kind of amateur scholarship that's happening and, and that's the producing these kinds of deep dive uh, YouTube videos, or is this, is this kind of a waste of time? Like, are we, are we chasing after trivia here? Is this an example of like super fan thinking where we need to trace out, you know, every pixel in Banjo-Kazooie, or is this kind of like a good, I can't figure it out. Like, I'm, okay, I'm so I, I, I don't know. I think in the, the, the overarching category of let's, let's dissect this in a pop culture analysis kind of way for a YouTube video, most of it is bad, right? Like most of it is just kind of spurious or I don't know, like real, like a lot of reaches, a lot of bad analysis, just uh, trying to get those, those favorites and, uh, and uh, subscribes, right? Like, like and subscribes or whatever, right? Yeah. But the, um, but this, this one I think is interesting. I think it's great. It's like, it's educational in a way that maybe its audience wouldn't have encountered. It's not scholarship, right? That's the thing. Well, why not? Because it's not well, within a, an official well, institution? No, it's just not done the way that you would do scholarship. If you really wanted to know on this about this topic, these people are, this isn't archaeology. These people are alive. Everybody who made these things are alive. <laughs> you Look, Lane Nooney is a scholar of this kind of right. stuff. What right. does she do? She like goes and sits outside of like Ken and Roberta Williams' house until they talk to her. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. right? And that's 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 like serious there's actually scholarship. a cease and desist at this point I yeah mean. they're like please <laughs> we, we can't tell you anymore. within 100 she, yards she like goes and talks to every single person from, from who worked at sierra online right yeah and I'm a big, you know i have to say i'm a i'm kind of a big fan of of youtube in general i think that that it's uh i mean there is a it, this kind of, even this kind of of kind of amateur a little bit more of an enthusiast uh kind of approach uh it it, it, it there's a lot of of interesting kind of uh, creative, um, semi-scholarly, semi-journalistic uh, sure. kind of video essays, and you have to wade through them, and it you you need a new kind of literacy to, to find the the, the wheat uh, within the chaff. But right, um, right, there's a lot it's of a gold mine, noise. You know, I, yeah. I I agree. I mean, it's better. I like it better than not having it. I just kind of feel sad. I'm like, I wish that the worlds of these of these that these are happening in were not so separate that there was no way that this per, that the people who put all this time into this stuff like they could have just asked somebody like what is alias 3 it's yeah. like oh yeah like everybody's using that then and it became maya like that's where the sexual came from right like there are there are human beings who could just tell them stories right that's that's how like it's a nice thing about human beings is that we can tell each other oral histories <laughs> 
yeah. of like how things happen. And it would be so much more illustrative than, than being like, oh, I matched this photo. Look, look, this is from this photograph, which yeah. feels like detective work. But you know what actual detectives do? They talk to human beings. <laughs> Yeah, right? that's a lot. That's um, a lot of what detective work is. Well, our and next our next item is another example of a kind of uh, uh, quasi scholarly archaeological project. This is a, a group called the Hidden Palace, who are, I think, just mostly amateur enthusiasts who are interested in uh, preserving video game history. Uh, they're working with uh, Jason Scott over at the Internet Archives, who we love a uh, big um, uh, you know, Jason Scott has done an amazing job in preserving video game history, uh, part of the Internet Archives. And this group just uh, a week ago released a thing that they're calling Project Deluge. And what that is, is a huge dump of over 700 rare, unreleased uh, PS2 software. So these are demos, these are early builds. Uh, things that were created for um, for trade shows uh, and 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 things like that. So um, that's interesting, I guess. And again, yeah, I'm again, it's super torn, cool. You know, on I, the one also, hand, I'm also a little torn. Yeah, and it's nice that we are thinking about our, our the history of our industry and and um, and working to to preserve it. On the other hand, it definitely feels like again this sort of uh, unrestrained super fan, uh, you know, uh, completism, you know, like, oh, every scrap of information uh, that we can possibly have about, you know, some obscure console, uh, like Wonderswan or something, every game ever available for Wonderswan is, you know, lovingly crafted and, and, uh, and preserved. Um, meanwhile, huge swaths of our, of our history go, um, without go underwater without notice like yeah the, yeah no it's you know. it, it really does like when these things happen you see like what kind of history is valued by by game culture and by by game communities and it's certain types of games are are in and considered like valuable history and other other kinds of games are like that's garbage who cares if it just burns and, and is gone forever right <laughs> and so like so, so of course we're we're bitter about that being from the you know the garbage the garbage side of history. Um, right, flash, that, but but flash, you know we shouldn't complain too much. An effort with yeah, that. That, we shouldn't complain too much. There's yeah. that guy who's like remaking one of our games from 2000. That's true. That's yeah, true. Uh, from 20 years the, ago. So. Um, yeah, the I can't remember the title of that game because it's junk bot. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, there's a guy Spybot, doing junk bot, the, and the there's nightfall. a spyball the nightfall Spybots. incident. Yeah. I bought the nightfall incident. But That's but again, it's like privileging of artifacts over over human beings, right? This is not archaeology where you would have to find some shards of like the people who once lived there and are now gone. Um, you could actually talk to people, right? Which I know is difficult. And I know there are huge barriers to be able to talk to people. I know that oftentimes you don't want to bother someone, and that's probably the correct take in a lot of cases. But I, I feel like there's a fetishization of, oh, we found this prototype. Like we don't really care that much about the, about you know, the story of the human beings who made this prototype and what their process was. We cared that there was like an artifact that was generated by that process that we can then play. And it makes me want, like also these dumps are often huge. It's like a, there's some, an element of quantity over quality where if you like, yeah, if they're, they're playing through these games, which is great. It's, it's better that they find them and play them than they're not. But they're sort of like, oh, wow, that was weird. Oh, yeah. Is this different than the release version? Yeah, kind of. It looks jankier. And it's not, you know, they don't have the time to actually do a close examination. But maybe someone will one of these days with it, this it, archive that, that's not lost as a result. I think there's also a case here of looking for your keys under the street lamp because the light is better there, right? So sure. in some cases, really what determines what gets preserved is what is preservable. Um, right. There are a lot of games that, you know, things like Facebook games that millions of people played, but it's almost impossible to, to even think about how you would try to preserve or, or recreate right. the ecosystem in which a Facebook game uh, existed. Um, and, and so that's, that's much harder. Uh, you know, I get into conversations with people about this, this topic where I tend to take more of the attitude of like, you know what, 
forgetting is good. <laughs> like games are not objects. Games are more like events. Right. Um, if you throw a party, uh, what you want to have is a, have created a great memory uh, to, to, to have like brought people together, to have made contacts, to have given people an amazing time. And to you have some documentation. To also be a snow globe. But you, you can know? have documentation, right? It's like, it doesn't have to be a souvenir, but maybe you have some photographs, right? You have yeah. like the, a way of preserving memories or like knowing what happened and passing that story down, but then also having an oral history, right? There are people who like do oral histories of amazing parties that happened. Yeah. And there's no reason that also couldn't happen with, with cultures of play and development. Um, but it, it does, I think, require a commitment to the, the human side of the, of the equation too. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a, a, one last item related to this, which is that uh, Sony has announced that it's preparing to shut down the PlayStation 3, PS Vita, and PlayStation Portable marketplaces this year. So those are going to be sunsetted. Uh, the the ways that you acquire games for all of their uh, for both for the PS3 and for for the uh, Vita and the the PSP. Um, so I mean, if you have any games that you haven't bought for your PSP, now's the time to do it. I guess. I guess so. Yeah, like I I love the PSP, um, and I I don't think I ever opened my PS Vita, but um, yeah the. The I, PSP I don't is know. the one that didn't do so well. Which one did really Vita, well? The Vita didn't do very well. Oh, the Vita, so yeah, okay. The PSP. Yeah, and so well. it really is like, yeah, like buy them while you can. I don't know. I think they should like put these all on super, super deep, deep discount. So people who are still using their Vita, like like G Slider and Chat should just be able to scoop up a lot of games. But yeah, like this underscores the fact that, I don't know. So the Vita and the PSP, they're still of this generation of, of handhelds where probably people were like buying a lot of physical games for them. Like a lot of the games were released physically. And it's still true of the Switch that games are released physically, but it's so common now that people are buying them download that I, I will be disturbed to see what happens with the Switch when it gets to this point, right? Like a, it'll just be a whole lot of games will just be impossible to access even as used, used games, right? You won't be able to buy them used anywhere because they'll be digital downloads, right? But so again, we have to look to emulation to save save us, and we have to try and I don't know resist legislation that tries to shut emulation down or like you know and protest legal enforcement of the this stuff. You know we we have our at the game center we're lucky enough to have a library where we have things like a, the mega cart and so forth that we will probably continue to do in perpetuity uh, and and defend against any kind of objections to that on the grounds that it's a library. Maybe, but, I think it's maybe yeah. good that that stuff operates in a gray area that's slightly outside the law. Yeah, it, and then the problem is when Nintendo decides to get litigious about it, right? That's uh, and yeah, shut down like a true. lot of emulation, like they did I don't know a year or two ago. Yeah, um, let them let them try to come uh, get the mega cart. Let yeah, they'll try. never they'll pry yeah. it from our cold dead Over fingers. My dead body. Yeah, exactly. Um, like you that. are you a big Noby Noby boy fan? Um, I do like Noby Noby boy. I think it's I think it's charming. It's uh. Yeah, you know, it is what it is. What about uh, Watam? Are you a big Watam fan? Have you played uh, Watam yet? I think I tried Watam once. Mm. I don't have enough of a Watam experience to um, to have an opinion on it. But yeah, it's 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 true that I think you know Kanemari Damashi was the the height of. Yeah, it was kind of all downhill after that. Uh, <laughs> a little bit. Let's be honest. Yes, it's, yeah. and mostly the best thing about. Uh, I, I don't think Damashi. I don't think Keita Takahashi would 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 disagree it's, strenuously is the uh is he knows the what his hit was yeah the soundtrack's the best thing about that game is that the the pillows i believe chat the pillows right in uh katamari that the pillows what a, what a great uh what a, yeah. what a terrific ost um, oh yeah Ten tenuana teens let's not forget that thank you diego yeah Tenuana um, teens good game <laughs> i think diego worked on that uh, so maybe that's one of the reasons that could be, but it was a good election. game. It was, that's it was Diego. Great. I'm, I, might, I might be misremembering that. Um, all right. So, okay. Now we're going to shift gears. We're going to go from history to politics. Let's just dig in and just, just deal right. with real issues, you know? Um, and we're going to have to talk about a game that we really haven't talked about yet on the discourse, which is Six Days in Felucia. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Naomi, what's going on with this game? What's what's the basic uh, contours of, of this controversy? So this this game was originally proposed, like and and funded by by um, what was it? 
what what company was behind it? Was it Taito or um, oh, uh, Konami, I believe. Konami, yeah. So Konami, yeah. actually, that's not surprising, right? So Konami uh, was originally funding this game, and it was a, a controversial idea because it's a game about uh, um, an actual military conflict, which is in very was in very recent living memory, and it's still in li living memory, right? But it was announced back in 2009, yeah, 11 years ago now. It's hard to believe, and there was a lot of objection, uh, especially from family members of people who had died. And I think that that's sort of what made Konami back off from it. But now um, the the developers, I think some of the original like creative direction team, they sort of brought it back and said, okay, we're gonna do it now under Atomic Games uh, and led by this guy, Peter Tomte. And the new round of controversy cropped up because Peter Tomte said, oh, we're not trying to make a political game. It's not our, it's not our job to say whether a war is good or bad. We're right. just trying to tell the stories that are involved. And that, you know, made a lot of people's heads explode. I was, I was pretty, it was like, that's a more extreme version of the kind of statements that Ubisoft are always kind of mealy mouthedly spitting out to be like, well, who can say if war is good or war is bad? That's a question that us mere game developers, we couldn't hope to be able to address. Like we have no idea. Yeah. You just, <laughs> and it's, it's so like disingenuous. One, one of the reasons that people are, are particularly upset about this is that it's, in some ways, the game is explicitly political. Um, right. it's, it's saying, hey, we want to tell the story of the um, American soldiers from, from their perspective in a way right. that um, gives you a sense of what it was like to be there and helps you empathize uh, with their position and uh, and which is obviously a, a kind of a, a deeply complicated political. It's extremely one-sided, right? And yeah. it's one-sided because, you know, well, so they, they're like, we're not showing anything from the point of view of the insurgents who were, you know, the people in Fallujah, like there were a lot of insurgents in Fallujah and the United States decided that there was too much trouble coming out of Fallujah. So there was a huge in invasion, you know, they sent the Marines in and, uh, and killed all the insurgents and a lot of Marines died too. And so, the, the position of this game is clearly like, it's not worth it to show it from the insurgents point of view. Even though, you know, the insurgents point of view was like, you illegally invaded our country and we are trying to sort of hold on to it. And you know, the, it's, I don't know, like the, the weird thing is that to be like, we don't know whether the Iraq war was good or bad. The Iraq war, like it's, it's pretty high on the list of wars that everyone is like, this war was just kind of trumped up war for oil and for right. like like insider cronies kind of manipulated things to get their way. And George W. Bush was like, "Those that guy kidnapped my daddy and I want to get him back and whatever else, right? Like spurious claims of WMDs. And like the United Nations was like, this is probably an illegal war. The UK did a, a, a like an inquiry. The UK, the only other country that joined the US in it, did an inquiry over the course of years where they concluded, yeah, this was illegal. Like the, we shouldn't have done this. It was unjustified. And uh, yeah, so the US invaded Iraq and, and I'm, what, Saddam Hussein, not a good leader, what, like, but re, and regardless, right? So like the goal was to just remove him, but what happened, like they destabilized the country and all, yeah. of, uh, all sorts of sectarian violence resulted. And that's, that's why Fallujah was a hotspot. And so it's totally the United States fault um, that yeah. all of this happened. And like, how are you going to tell the story of Fallujah and be like, well, we're not worrying about that context. There's no whether context it was for good this. or bad yeah. or whether it's, there, there's also there's there's a larger political position, which is simply anti-war, which is like the, sure. the war is bad and to be avoided at all costs, um, e even even wars that we collectively decide are necessary or unavoidable are horrific and you know and uh and and that th that is not a position that is um ubiquitous and that's not a position that that just you know um everyone accepts as obvious that's actually sure. a political position that is something that every work of art that refers to war that takes place during war that uses war as subject matter is engaging with right in one yep. way or another. So it's, so it's totally insincere um, to take this position of like, uh, of, of, oh, we want to just, you know, cherry pick um, the aspects of war that we think are going to be meaningful and, and compelling. Um, and then we can just, you know, insulate ourselves uh, from these other issues. Um, you know who had a nice take on this? MFA alum Chris Chung, 
yeah, who fantastic a video thoughts. essay to YouTube um, that I thought was very uh, thoughtful. So Chris uh, served in the military, was uh, on, on a submarine, um, and uh, is really exploring this from from his perspective as as you know, as, as someone who served uh, in the armed forces. Um, you know, very critical of, of the developers uh, attempt to kind of duck this issue. But the thing that Chris did that I really appreciated was articulate the different layers of meaning that the word political has for people in the military. Um, he, he does make the point that uh, for a soldier to say that something is political is kind of to say that it was bullshit. Uh, why do we have these new uniforms that are that they're making us the old uniforms are just as good? Oh, it must have been political. Why is this person in charge that they're not, um, you know, that they're not qualified to be making this decision, but now they're in charge? Oh, it's political. Like, meaning that uh, if it's the result of decision making that wasn't a sort of honest problem solving approach to, uh, to you know, to, to achieving some goal, but rather the result of someone's connections or some backroom deals, uh, and it optics, leads to an, yeah, like, like it's it's all about optics instead of you know. Results. Yeah, those are those are the ways in which um, the term political uh, for for that particular community has these other meanings, and so it does add at a at a layer, I think, uh, to the discussion. Yeah, and he he takes the the developers to task by saying, look, you can't just borrow this usage of political from the military because you're making a military game right. you're not in the military you're you're a creative professional making a game yeah. and then of course there are totally different reasons to deploy the like oh we don't want to be political in the context of the game industry so it's very i think he, he really puts a fine point on why it's uh disingenuous can we enjoy for a second that the multi-layered captioning that's happening right now i think this is this is kind of a uh, cyberpunk that we have like uh we have three different <laughs> strands. We've got Logan's uh, Chiron. We've got Mirabai working hard uh, to, to caption what we're saying. And then we're also watching Chris's video, which has its own captions in it. Um, that's It's kind of a palimpsest, if you will. Uh, the other thing I like about uh, Chris's thing is that he uses the phrase, really chaps my ass, which is a <laughs> bit of military slang that I hadn't uh, encountered before. And now, I, I quite yeah, like and it. I can just I can just hear him saying that too. Yeah. Um, but but one other interesting thing that I noticed in the coverage of uh, of of this game that um, somebody who the Game Center has actually admired for a long time is is one of the the significant designers here. It's Jamie Griesemer. Ah, yeah. This is yeah. when you told me about this. I was uh, really interested. So the next article that we're looking at. Yep. Um, is about the game's procedural architecture system, which I believe J Jamie is one of the people working on this process. That's right, yeah, yeah. So, the, and this is essential to the, the narrative, I guess the narrative design of the game, right? That there are these unpredictable events that happen and that that's the, the part of war that they're trying to portray is you don't know what's gonna be around the next corner. Like you don't know whether you're gonna live or die. Uh, and, <clears throat> I don't know. I'm fascinated by this. So I actually, this, this caught my attention because um, Professor Mitu Kondaker posts about it saying, you know, pointing out that she's been studying procedural generation for a long time. And like a lot of people who write about procedural generation in, you know, in, in various contexts, design, academics, and so forth, talk about the ethics of procedural generation. And I think, so Jamie Griesemer is clearly doing some fancy design here and making a very unpredictable uh, emergent war game in a way that hasn't been made before. He's probably mm -hmm. like, he's a very smart tuner of uh, shooters uh, who I'm sure will do a great job at it. But the, the question, the interesting question for me here ethically is, okay, you are both purporting to, you're purporting to represent the experience of, of the soldiers, like actual people, right? But then because it's a game uh, and it's not a game like Dysphoria, right? It's, you're not actually just doing biography here. You're not just recounting what happened. You, instead, they're creating a procedural simulation that generates a variety of experiences, which they are, the, and, and the claim is these experiences represent the actual things that happened once, but now they can happen millions of times differently to everybody. So now, but, we're, now we're deep in Ian Bogos territory, right? Yeah, because yeah. we're talking about the representational power of games, the persuasive power 
of gains as right. rhetoric uh, through their processes. Yeah, exactly. And so, and but the relationship to history for me is fascinating here, right? Because that's what the controversy about this game is all about. Is this a accurate, compassionate, even-handed, fair, just portrayal of history? And it's, and so it's it's kind of a portrayal of history. It's a sandbox version of history where, and, and so the, the Greasomer is in charge of of laying down the parameters of like what kind of random things can happen to soldiers. Yeah. Right. And, it's, so, and if you listen, if you if you read this article where they're discussing it, um, what they're what they're saying is uh, the the experience of most games uh, of of this kind, most single player war games, is basically an experience of of memorization. That you have a software which is recreating an event, and but b- because the way it's recreated. You th- solving the problem of, of of getting through that is often um, it's like that Tom Cruise movie where you just go back through over and over again. You go through the same yeah. sequence Ed- of events. Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah, Edge of Tomorrow, which is yeah. by the way a pretty good movie, pretty good Tom Cruise movie. Um, and and eventually you you kind of you master this by by you know memorizing and and uh, learning h- how all of the quirks work. It's like. And that's a really bad representation of what it's like to be in this situation. So there's actually a, a kind of genuinely interesting design problem that they're struggling with. How do we create the real experience, which is one of uncertainty, the fog of war, surprise. There is right. no point at which you are able to say, okay, this is what's going to happen. You're always in a position of having to uh, respond to spontaneous events and improvise and operate with partial knowledge. And um, and that's a, that's a genuinely, like if that were in a game that was owning its status as war art and was dealing in an honest, straightforward way with the complexity of the politics of the situation, could be a great game. I mean, it really could be. It could be so. I think I agree with what Alexander King is saying saying in chat, right? So that what you're memorizing instead is not just a pattern like a Zelda boss. You're mm-hmm. memorizing like the all the parameters of the system, the possibility space, right? It's just you're memorizing one level up, uh, as Alexander says. And I think there's actually a, a significant danger in that because it creates more of an illusion that you understand all the possibilities of but but maybe of, what, of but, what's being represented, but but. But maybe that's what generals do. I mean, maybe that's what Clausewitz would say. Yes, what I meant by fog of war. It's like that you do learn at a level up. There is things. Yeah, there are ah, things you can ah, learn. But this is not purport. This is exactly what Tomte says. He does not want to represent the experience of the generals and the political decision makers back in Washington. He wants to represent the experience of the soldiers. The t- and he wants to create a, a, a scary experience where you feel like you're going to die. Right. And so there's. There's an interesting disjuncture mm-hmm. there, right? That, um, yeah, I don't know. This this reminds me of of like uh, the games that we frequently talk about, where it's like r- purports to represent what it's like to be poor, like spent, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, if I play this game a bunch and I get really good at it, then have I encompassed in like my in a represented way, like what it means to be poor? Am I good at it? Like if I play, yeah. if I get really good at Five Days of Fallujah, have I? What do I understand? Uh, about Fallujah. Now, the developers will certainly caveat and say, like, of course, it's nothing like the actual experience. But I don't know, there's there's always going to be a line around, like, what uh, they allow to happen, right? Like, certain stories, certain things that actually happen in Fallujah probably are not going to be in this game because they're off the radar, right? Like, a whole bunch of experiences are not included inside of inside of the bounds of the game. And so they are not part of that unpredictable landscape of possibility. And that is ultimately a, like an intensely political decision. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, the, I think this is actually super interesting in, in that thinking about simulation uh, yeah. as a mode of, of, of expression, as a mode of culture and art, and how it relates to these questions of, of politics, of meaning of a work. Um, I just think it's, it's, it's genuinely really interesting. Uh, I, I once played, I think it was probably Arma. Is Arma the the, the game that's like a super high, hyper-realistic simulation? Um, I, I think it was Arma. Arma. 
I mean, Arma and is, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a big tactical military shooter. It has lots of um, scales going on, I guess. I mean, the, the, this has been around since like the, um, what, what, the World War II online kind of games, right? Where there's yeah. like, things happening, a lot of, lot of I think uh, I played, scales. I think I played Arma once in which, so it's like they're modeling um, every little detail of the, of the mechanics and, and, and of the right. weapons and everything else and the physics. And my experience playing that game was, I enjoyed it so much because it was so broken. I, the, the beginning of my experience, I was sitting in a truck and I'm sitting in the back of a truck going towards the battle. And um, it's like me and like eight other grunts and we're sitting, we're com complaining and we're getting ready for this battle. We, some of us might never come back from. And at a certain point, I'm like, what's going on? I look out the back of the truck and we're not moving. The truck is stuck on a little <laughs> uh, rut in the, in the terrain. And this truck is just like, for 20 minutes, it's just been sitting kind of like jiggling in place. And, um, and this way, yeah, no, that's perfect. And, and like, eventually I walked over to where the battle was and it's a bunch of people. They're like shooting at a farmhouse where there's people shooting back and stuff. And then I just like, I turned and I walked away and I walked for like 15 minutes. I walked all the way back to the starting area and there were still people hanging out at the starting area. The people who had given me the, the you know, the, the, the command, the mission to go uh, join the battle. And they're just standing there, they're smoking. And I just stood there and it was like, it was like being in catch 22. Like it, right. it worked so well as a weird kind of Samuel Beckett parody of war. Right, uh, well those, and, just... and it captures some of the weird stuff that people complain in the more polished military simulations is never addressed, right? The yeah. weird amount of waiting, the glitches, the bureaucratic snafus. Yeah, it was, it was, the best, it was the yeah. best game about war that, I, that I've ever played. And it wasn't intentionally good i mean it was but it's not that it was intentionally right. bad. but that's Their the problem intention... intentionally good is the problem right i mean this is yeah this is what like a triple a game is going to do is polish off all of those edges so so that you have just the experience that players want right which in yeah. the case of six days of fallujah is like a pulse pounding adrenaline racing terrifying experience of like busting down a door and who knows whether someone's going to shoot you right away or not and of course it, they're, they're going to shoot you after the third door you bust down or whatever procedurally somehow so who cares or maybe you're going to blow up the wall actually did you notice that in the there's that one of the things that Griezmann talks about is that they're doing a lot of really destructible environments for six days in Fallujah right um and I think you mentioned that that's yeah that kind of really refers to this um, type of warfare that was pioneered, you know, in another very legally dubious conflict. Yeah, this this made me think of an amazing essay, which I love, which yeah, is this, this next piece, which is, it's not news, this is from like 10 years ago or something. This is a uh, essay on building blog called Nakatomi Space, right. uh, referring to the, to Die Hard, to the building in Die Hard, but it starts at, as a riff on an essay uh, about the, the 2002 invasion of Nablus, which is a right. similar kind of uh, warfare, uh, but in which the, um, the the Israeli forces were moving through the city without using the roads and the sidewalks. They were right, moving- Just going through the walls, going through, through all walls. the walls. They were moving through buildings. Um, this was kind of like a, a new approach uh, of, of just like drilling through, they would just like take out walls, move through buildings, like- Right through someone's through living room where there were people, there were civilians, things like that. Yeah. Right? yeah. And so this, this architecture essay is talking about, about how, um, how fascinating this is as a new way of seeing urban space, as a new way of understanding the logic of, of buildings and the city. Uh, and, and the reason I actually found this essay was a reference to it from uh, a guy named Guern, who's an AI researcher and, and creator who was talking about this idea in the context of the hacker mindset and the speedrunner mindset. So it kind of comes full circle because his point is like, really what the hacker mindset is, is a kind of out of control reductionism. It is a literalism. Like normally when we are facing a problem or we're in a situation, we see it in terms of all of the larger categories that we operate by. Here are the rules, and here are the institutions, and here are the customs, and here's what you're supposed to do, and here's the conventions, and you know, here's the authority and stuff. And what a hacker sees is just atoms. Every situation is just atoms. So if you're trying to like break into a building, um, you know, you're trying to break into a room that has a computer in it with information on it, 
you're like, oh, you're looking at the lock. You're thinking, how can I, how can I, uh, you know, take out this lock? Can I maybe, you know, can I, can I pick it? You know, is it a combination? Can I, uh, you know, and, but what you might not be thinking of is just like, you take a saw and you cut a hole in the wall next to the door. Right. That a wall is just atoms. Like that we, but we see the world in terms of like, as if walls were real. And uh, what a speedrunner does is look at the atoms of a game, right? What, what, a, what they don't, they no longer like, oh, I know this is a wall. You're supposed to go here. You're supposed to do this mission, but really it's just, just code. Uh, and we can do, you know, whatever it takes that we want to do. Um, it's a beautiful essay and it kind of like brings this whole question full circle to, to the idea of gamer mentality or kind of like uh yeah because of course thinking. this is a this is a hotly desired feature in a lot of shooters right destructible environments has been high on the list of like oh let's do that for a long time and i think it's it's because over the last 18 to 19 years like this kind of warfare has become more common right um yeah so yeah i think well, uh, brian upton i believe it's brian upton uh makes a point in in the book that he wrote about game design that um, when you were looking at a wall in a video game, you you never bump into it. You never go up to a wall and say, "Is this actually prohibiting my movement?" Oh, it really? Is I do that. In, in yeah, the... I mean, some people do, but most of the ninety nine percent of the. But time, that's how you, you look for secret doors. <laughs> <laughs> but in most cases, walls constrain you as a kind of contract. As, as a mm, kind of agreement right. that you make. Psychologically, they constrain you, right? It is, it is, yeah, it's a conversation you're having with the designer, but if you actually check walls, they don't constrain you as much as you might. Right, think. yeah, and, that, and that's a terrifying what, thought. Yeah, and speed, is, speed you know, runners, that's what speed runners play walls. with, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think we should relate to actual walls more like that too. I think it's, it's true of how a lot of people relate to actual walls. Children relate to walls differently than adults, if you've noticed yeah. like, and, and pen aware. testers, hackers you know? and pen testers yeah, exactly. relate to walls sure. in this in this kind of uh, way. Um, we should also just mention uh, Jamie uh, Griesemer uh, is is much beloved around these parts for these amazing uh, G GDC talks that he gave years ago uh, about called, when he was working on Halo. Yeah, they're about yeah Halo. design and detail. So if you ever want to look at some amazing GDC talks, where he, uh, and the beautiful thing about them is he takes a single detail like the the, the reload time for a sniper rifle, changing it from 1.7 seconds to 0.8 seconds. And right. he like breaks down that one question and talks for an hour about all the different like thought that went into it and the testing and, and all of the impacts and stuff. It's, they're, they're beautiful deep dives into the nuts and bolts of, of game design, so. Yeah, and he's done, got some great uh, blog posts about level design too and, uh, yeah. and heat maps and how to use them, so. Um, there's one stuff. other, Political. I don't know if this is a political issue, but um, it is. it's a uh, censorship issue. Yeah. Disco Elysium was banned in Australia. Yeah. So this is oh, it's so classic, right? It's um, all of our favorite things about uh, games being prohibited in recent years. Different different standards applied to games than to other media, right? It's because of interactivity. Anything that's interactive gets the game. Uh, standards applied to it and in this case yeah like any the, the what's prohibited is depicting exposing or otherwise dealing with matters of sex drug misuse or addiction crime cruelty violence or revolting or abhorrent phenomenon in a way that is uh is immoral or indecent right so it's like you can't uh you can't like no moral turpitude in games like it's a lot of that stuff is perfectly fine of course in films uh right. there are plenty of examples but uh, games are, are held to a different standard. Uh, and Disco Elysium, like such a fascinating case for, for that to crop up in, right? Because yeah. the presumption of interactivity being a problem would be like, well, you are the one taking drugs. So surely that's different than like you watching, um, you know, Nick, Nick Cage take drugs in a movie, right? Yeah. Um, but in Disco what Elysium, is that true? Is that true? It's like, it's more like watching Nick Cage take drugs. It's, it's, it's a fundamental misunderstanding. Yeah. That is, I guess a version of the immersive fallacy maybe that people still right. kind of have as a go-to naive story about how interactivity works and how about simulations work. Um, you are, when you are playing a game, you are more likely to have a kind of distance from the, the work. 
Uh, because when you play a game, you're in the mindset of like, okay, what's happening here? What do I do? What are the ranges of, of possible? What are the what are the degrees of freedom here? What are the problems I'm trying to solve? You're in a very often you're already in a very kind of analytical mindset uh, where you're a little bit distanced. And it's ironic because we we tell this opposite story, which is oh, because it's interactive, it closes the gap between you and the character. And now you're actually like, and maybe to a certain degree, that's true. I do think that on a certain level, it's true of the experience of shooting, you're shooting over and over again, it's, it's you shooting. And so like, sure, if you're in a punching game or a shooting game sure. or a jumping game, it does create our, our, like a our old pal visceral Catherine, connection. Yeah. Our old pal, Catherine Ismister has a great way of talking about this. And that, you know, that part of the problem with immersive fallacy is it's not looking at there are so many different layers on which a player might be connecting to uh, yeah. a character avatar they're controlling in the game. One of them would be this sort of like visceral layer of like, okay, I'm jumping, I'm shooting, I, I have game feel that's, yeah. that, you know, I, can, I get force feedback or something. But then there's another layer, which like you're saying is very, is like a cognitive layer where you're thinking yes. strategically and you're like, okay, I'm looking at this as a problem, mm -hmm. not as like a visceral immersive experience. I'm stepping back. And then there's like maybe a, a layer of um, of storytelling and interactions between characters and personalities. Sure. There's an where interpretive it's, it's, layer, a kind of right. hermeneutics of, of like, oh, what does this mean? Why? Is yeah, this, what does it mean in a cultural context? To? And I would say Disco Elysium is very much on the far end of that spectrum. Like you are always aware of the fact that it's, first of all, that you're engaging with a work of art. Mm -hmm. uh, you're aware of the fact that it's constructed, that the meanings are layered. Um, at no point are you just kind of like on cruise control, you know, right. <laughs> having- All right, I'm doing these drugs, but yeah, yeah, yeah I don't know. And, the, and um, the, the game's take on drugs and I don't know, everything is, is pretty nuanced and layered and weird and- And great. Limey and great, yeah. yeah. So it's, I, I, I wouldn't expect um, the censorship board for Australia to, uh, to, to get, get all that nuance, but- in some ways, it's like, yeah, you couldn't have picked on a more interesting artistic game to try and swing that hammer at. I hope that they, I hope that it's occasion for uh, the anti-moral panic crew in Australia to push is some it, of that BS over. Is it true that you can have a pet spider in Disco? I didn't have a pet spider. I, isn't there like I a really giant that game poorly? I, I, isn't there I, some sort of metaphysical? Yeah, I think maybe I know maybe I the counter oh, is the phasmid a, a spoiler, spider? Yeah, the, the, I encountered this cryptid, which I totally botched my cryptid encounter. I think for many people that was like a wonderful moment, and I think I chased it away. It was saying saying the wrong thing or something. Um, There's a man I, who crawls on the ceiling and is kind of like a spider. I like that guy. Oh yeah, I like that guy too. Um, <laughs> It's such a good game. It's you know, they're game. coming out with a with a special version of it. Um, All right. Which I'm going to give you my hot take and you tell me what you think. Um, I think one of the great things about Disco Elysium is it has a little bit of voice acting. And, Just a little bit, um, not, not a, a lot a, of voice huge, acting. It's a huge, yeah, there's a ton of writing in the game and the writing is spectacular. And this new version now has all voice acting. It's got, so it's all of the text in the game now has VO. And I, my hot take You're is that sure that's a that? terrible mistake. I think it mm. was perfect the way it was. I think voice acting is, as much as I love my my voice actors, friends, and and I just think it's super problematic from a design point of view. It's always in my head a strange conflict in a game with a lot of reading to also have a lot of voice acting, the timing is different. And then you're kind of like in this weird struggle. Do I turn it off and then read? Do I just right. sit back and listen? It's just, I well, don't know. I'll tell you it really well in the original version. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard for me to say without playing it, but I will tell you what I thought, which was, oh, now I can play it with my partner because mm. we, we like to play story games together, but it's hard for us to, to play games that are just all about reading and, and paging through a bunch of texts. So voice acting is a great boon if you're kind of experiencing an interactive work with other people instead of watching TV together or something like that. So. All right, well, that's good. And you know what? I trust uh, Studio Zaum. Those folks know what they're doing. They, they they're do, yeah, cool. they're, mm -hmm. they're super Agreed. cool. Yeah. All right, uh, we have time for maybe a little okay. bit more. Qu quick, do uh, you want to do sports talk? Sports, sure. Sports. Let's listen. What's going on in sports? I don't know. Some referee got fired for making a makeup call. This is, look, this is, I'm going to be honest with you. This, we're just throwing a bone to Matt Parker. He, he keeps <laughs> feeding us these sports links. I don't know. There's a referee in the NHL who uh, had a hot mic 
and was saying something like, you know what, I'm gonna, uh, I wanted to give these guys a, a penalty real quick because of some other reason. And that's why I did it. And it got captured in the, in the broadcast. Right. It's yeah. one of those things. It's, I don't know. It's like an open secret, right? That referees do this. You're not supposed to talk about it, but yeah. Yeah. Referees are not, they're not perfect. They, you know, it's not all 100% perfect adherence to the code of law. Um, I don't know. Go read some uh, Steven Snyderman unwritten rules for really elaborate thoughts on yeah. why, like, even a referee is not a complete, like, closed, bounded rule set. There's always slippage around the edge. And the, for the referees, the slippage is, okay, yeah, sometimes we got to try and balance the books because we screwed something else up. Right. Yeah. Oh, and uh, Tony Pizza's pointing out there's uh, some other sports news. WNBA is getting new jerseys. That's exciting. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Now, t t Tony is also a source of uh, great sports news. So, uh, in uh, I also I will throw a, 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 a I'm a big fan of the series uh, called The Code uh, by this guy Ross Bernstein along the similar lines that you were mentioning. So, if you are interested in that topic, uh, oh yeah, sort of the unwritten rules of sports fascinating and much more interesting than you might imagine. So um, highly recommended. Um, good to me. All right, so now we have a, a couple of other just uh, random, let's we quickly go through the, these last- Yeah, let's, let's, let's just go through the-, the Super quickly. Mario World theme park opened in Japan. Oh, um, yeah. Scream in your hearts, not out loud. That's the, the slogan that they have. They don't want, <laughs> everyone's got masks and we're trying to maintain distance protocols, uh, but you're riding on a roller coaster. They literally tell people not to scream. I think there's something kind of nice about that. Right, and um, probably because it's Japan, a lot of people are very politely uh, doing their best not to scream. Yeah. Um, and uh, I know that somebody said, I think you know somebody uh, at the Game Center suggested that possibly a friend of the Game Center and adjunct professor uh, Kaho Abe might have like helped design some of the attractions. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, NYU has this uh, long tradition of physical computing, um, big games, uh, you know, this kind of uh, this real world overlap between video games. So it's kind of part of our of, of our legacy. Um, Kaho, you know, did, did a bunch of that. ITP, of course, uh, very much focused on that. Um, and so, yeah, so I think there's something nice about these kinds of uh, blended environments. Uh, uh, there's, okay, so another quick item, uh, the Twitch mm -hmm. stop sign cam. Oh, uh, I, yeah, it's uh, very compelling. Very yep. compelling stop sign. Yeah, so it's it's fascinating. The, the, I mean, the main premise of this stop sign cam is that nobody stops there, right? Like you just it watch is, and- <laughs> It is a particularly challenging three-way intersection in which um, through a combination, I think of uh, the, the, the nature of how with the lines of sight line up and then also just the traditions that have developed. Yeah, pretty much everyone just does a rolling a slow roll through this. Right, slow roll and then yeah. just like, it doesn't come to a full stop. Yeah. So I guess the game is, can you actually catch a full stop on camera? Or at least that would be one way to, to play this. I think but, it does um, happen occasionally. But this is another example of the hacker mindset. It, like if, if programmers love the way systems get implemented in the real world, they love looking at like the counter at a donut shop and thinking, oh, the register should be on the other side. You know, that this idea of efficiencies and the ways that like rules and systems interface with you know the the real world, uh, I think it's just there's something endlessly uh, fascinating about that to uh, to a certain mindset. Right, and then yeah. yeah, begging the question like, oh, do Pete does how important is it for people to come to a full stop? I mean, it's the law, right? But is it actually going to prevent? Like, are there a bunch of accidents at this corner? I mean, I think I think I seem to have read that, yeah, that the, this is a kind of a dangerous corner. So. Yeah, it also is an example of uh, the sort of Heisenberg principle of once you observe a system, uh, you've changed it because now you right. see people uh, slowing yeah. down and waving. Oh, go, okay, so I've reached that point already, huh? And waves. So everyone, yeah. I think, is now aware of the fact that that well, that was this inevitable. Is, uh, an experiment, no longer a natural experiment, just a regular old experiment. Right. Um, the next thing is, I think, something you pointed out, uh, Naomi, which oh, is font and on font with uh, a video game inside of it. Explain yeah, what's so going on here. All right, so this is a, an OTF font. I mean, a lot of you have probably uh, installed fonts at one point or another on your computers by you know, double clicking little TTF files or OTF files and installing them. But did you know that those, those font files have such complicated instructions inside them on how to 
render characters that they can be used to play games. So somebody has created a Pokemon style game that's all inside of one font. And you can play it in a web browser just by typing literally anything uh, and it will play, it'll animate using the, yeah, using just the instructions inside the font uh, to change the characters that are being displayed. And the characters like, I don't know, like a whole frame of this. I don't totally get exactly how it works, but there's fascinating documentation too. And then when you get to certain choice points, in the game, you can like choose like what uh, what attack your Fontimon uses or whatever by 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 pressing A or B, uh, just like you might um, if you were playing it on a Game Boy. So um, yeah, so you can play a whole branching adventure. It, it's like you can you can develop branching adventures in this, and uh, and of course, so this is Pokemon kind of constructed as a branching adventure, not like a totally open ended uh, simulated system. And, and it takes but place it's in extremely, Minneapolis, apparently. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. yeah, and it's uh, but it's it's fascinating, like that all of this was was uh, was done inside of one font file. There's a lot of different platforms you can play it on because OTF is a is a, a open open type format. Uh, so sort of beautiful, extremely weird. Uh, yeah. Once again, yeah. Once again, every, to make games. Like, yeah. Everything is atoms, like in a way. Like you you look at a font and you're like, <laughs> well, that's just that's just information. And uh, Turing, you know, showed us that all information is basically the same. Uh, right. That there is a kind of, you know, there's a universal quality to uh, to information and computation. That why not? You know, you this is like you see these wonderful experiments with embedded systems where people have uh, Doom running on a doorknob. You know right. what I mean? <laughs> doorknob, yeah. yeah. And. Uh, and it's like, on the one hand, you're like, well, maybe this is an example of things are out of control. Like our fonts have gotten too big and too complicated and we need to roll back the clock and get back to a simpler form of typeface. But I don't think we are gonna roll back the no, clock. No, I mean, I it's beautiful because- forward. Yeah, because, I mean, OTF has been around for a long time and the designers of it were like, oh, let's make this robust, right? Which is like, I kind of love that spirit too because it leads to all sorts of weird the possibilities. And weird possibilities are great. Thank you, OTF uh, working group that made this possible in the yeah. first place. Um, yeah, I think two thumbs up for Fontamon. Yeah, and to Quasi Otter's question, can you make the monsters kiss? Probably if you hack that font file, you can definitely make the, font, the monsters kiss. The whole kiss. point is you can it's, make the monsters up to do whatever you. you want. It's up to you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's up to you. All right, you we're, I think we're close to- All right, one, one last one more One last, one last one. All right. Uh, you can now, it, it, the, the ship has been loosened, right? As far as I understand, Ever Given is now yep. uh, coasting, it's sailing. It's, it's been freed. Uh, international, yeah, shipping crisis averted. Suez Canal. Yeah. Uh, open I'm not up sure again. if averted is the right, right way to no, describe a no. hundred billion dollars uh, okay. that we lost. But uh, oh, it's, it's kind of love the Suez over. Canal. That's how uh, in, it, the, the Suez the Canal is, toppled the British Empire. Remember, it's like. True. Or, yeah, it is like at, at Nasser sunk a bunch of did did exactly this right. He sunk a bunch of boats at the opening to the Suez Canal, and he was like, "Fuck you, British!" And that was basically they had to you know back it's off. It's all of Egypt. politics. It's all atoms. It's all politics. It's all politics. That is what we're here to tell you. Everything is atoms, and everything is politics. Uh, but you, this is Microsoft Flight Simulator. You can now fly mm -hmm. over the stuck boat in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Yeah, of course. Is, which is why this is uh, this is uh, relevant uh, to the discourse, because um, <laughs> games uh, uh, games consume everything. Uh, and, there you have uh, it, <laughs> and, 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 and spit it back out um, as atoms and politics. Uh, can you explain to me why is is it called Ever Given or Ever Green? The boat's name is Ever, ever Given. Given. Why did it say Ever Green on the side? I, I don't know. I thought anyone ever... chat. Can you explain? To, am I the only person? Every time I see it, I think, am I having a stroke? Why? Why is this right? It's like, uh, um, but oh, I think Evergreen is the boating company. Interesting. And the name and ever of given the... is the name of this particular ship. Why would you do that? I guess it's just I don't know. Yeah. I don't understand ship naming conventions any more than yeah. horse naming conventions. They they didn't expect this uh, this boat to become uh, an international celebrity. So they didn't really right. think through. Oh, everything. they name all their boats ever, ever, ever Goober, ever Govin, ever Govindan, ever. No, ever play right. Microsoft Flight Simulator? Yeah. Yeah. I, it's I'll hard work. to play nowadays. It is. It as is. As far as a beefy machine. It's true. 
Um, All right, I guess we should wrap. I think maybe that's there. It. Are that's we, it. That's our last news item. That's our last news and, item. Maybe if we have a minute left, um, you can explain to me how Loop Hero works. You haven't played Loop Hero yet. I, so. I don't know how Loop Hero works. It's a very I, Naomi game. It's a very frank okay, game. Okay, tr I'll try it. The two of us, I think, should should play it and compare notes. I'm all of my friends are addicted to it. I kind of bounced off of it. I need yeah, someone I, to explain I'm to me. I'm supposed what to I'm play. Missing. I know I've been told I'm supposed to play it by a lot of people, and right. uh, and I have not sat down to do that yet. So next week yeah, um, we'll, we'll we'll talk about Loop Hero and maybe uh, maybe chat can, yeah. can explain to us uh, how, how to play it and enjoy it. Sounds good. Um, all right, thanks everybody. Thank you, Thank Logan. You. Thanks, Mirabai. Thanks, Mirabai. And uh, and Mir as Mirabai pointed out, Poland was involved in the Gulf War too. Just a little historical note. Don't forget, thanks, Mirabai. Yeah. Don't forget <laughs> Poland, always at the center of so much <laughs> trouble. Not their fault, but you got to wonder at a certain point. There's that much smoke. Um, uh, thanks, chat. As always, we, we, we're here for you guys. So uh, thanks for, for showing up for us. And we salute you. We War salute. is bad. You really <laughs> chop our ass, but in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning into the discourse. Once again, your news hosts have been Naomi Clark and Frank Lance. I was your behind the scenes operator, Logan Clare. Graphics are by Winnie Song and captioning was by Mirror by Night of Stunner Night Cart Services. That's all for now. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time.